the song? Okay, let's uh, yeah, let's get started. Um, first of all, are there any questions or issues of any sort? Okay, so what I'm going to do today is talk. We're, we're a little bit off the schedule in terms of the chapter, in terms of the book, because uh, there's some material in this, a bunch of material in this uh, lecture is not in the book, but I think it's important and helpful material that you should have. So just a little flag that what we're going to do is go to the brain and behavior chapter in the book on Wednesday. We'll start talking about brain development. But today, what we're going to do is extend a little bit of the discussion that we had before about birth and also about newborns, because there's material in there that I think is important that actually isn't in the book. So, so listen up. Um, so what I'm going to do is, as I promised when I talked about the birth lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know about some of these medical procedures in childbirth, um, and then we'll have a little explanation break, which we didn't have in the last lecture to talk about birth. And then I'm going to talk about some very basic facts about newborn babies and what newborn babies are like, and particularly about their arousal levels, their sleeping, and their eating, uh, which again, especially for all of you who are likely to have babies at some point, um, uh, but haven't yet, is extremely useful, practical, as well as theoretical information. Yeah, question? I have a question. Yeah. Are you going to see our babies on the on the Are you going to see our babies? My babies? Yes. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, we'll be sick of looking at my babies by the time this, uh, by the time this, uh, this, um, this class is over. Um, okay, so let me start out by talking about um, by talking about medical procedures in childbirth. That was something that we started talking about a little bit at the end of the class, and a bunch of people were talking talking to me about after the class, and that seemed like a good sign that we should go over it a little bit more. So, what are some of the the uh, procedures that uh, have been introduced into childbirth by the medical system? Now, obviously, when we're giving birth for many, many, many years without any kind of medical intervention at all, um, and it seems at least logical that most moms uh, could give birth perfectly well without any medical intervention at all. But here are some of the interventions that are done on a fairly regular basis. So, one of them is actually inducing labor, and inducing labor means that uh, moms are given a drug, oxytocin, which we'll talk about a bit later on, and it has the effect of actually starting uh, starting uh, the contractions that lead to labor more quickly than they had just uh, developed naturally. Um, and this gets done for a variety of reasons. Usually the sort of rationale is that if it's two weeks after the baby's due date, then very often people will induce labor. It's not clear that there's very very good scientific basis for that, because for one thing, it's not very clear exactly what the baby's due date is. So there's a lot of variance in how good the estimates are when babies are actually due to be born. Um, in fact, most firstborn babies are after their due date, which of course seems a little weird when you think about it. So most, most firstborn babies are late, which makes you think, well, wait a minute, and that must mean that there's something wrong about the way that they're calculating uh, the due date for firstborn babies. Um, and of course, as always with all these things, there are some situations in which, say, the baby is in distress, in which it makes sense to induce labor. There's also lots of cases of labor being induced because it's more convenient for the doctors who you know are going to be there at a particular point um, or at a particular time of the day. Um, and the trouble with inducing labor is that typically, though not always, the contractions are more powerful and less easily controlled when labor is induced than when labor just occurs spontaneously. So as I mentioned, there's this kind of trade-off, which is you can have a long labor, and you'll hear women sometimes boasting about, you know, why we labor for 48 hours or something. But being in labor for 48 hours when you've got these relatively mild contractions is very different from being in labor even for six hours with very strong contractions that come on very suddenly. So the problem with inducing labor is that it tends to increase the strength and increase the abruptness of uh, increase the abruptness of labor contractions, and that tends to make them harder to control. Uh, makes the makes the uh, issues about pain and so forth harder to deal with than when uh, labor is occurring spontaneously. Um, the second common medical procedure in childbirth is various kinds of anesthetic drugs to uh, numb the uh, feeling of childbirth. Um, as I said last time, these have varied across the ages. They started out with ether, one of the very first anesthetics. Um, when general anesthetics get used, they pass through from the mother to the baby, as in the case of my birth with Dargon. Um, and there's evidence that that can actually influence the baby negatively. So there's less of a tendency nowadays to use these general anesthetics. And instead, the sort of anesthetic of choice is an epidural. And the way an epidural works is that it's actually an injection in your spinal cord, and it blocks the sensation in the lower half of your body. So it's like what happens when you, you know, get a tooth pulled in, the half of your face gets, uh, half of your, your face gets numb. And that has the effect of not feeling the contractions anymore. Um, but the, again, the downside, so that kills the pain of flavor, there's no question about it. The downside of that is that, as I mentioned last time, because you're not feeling the, uh, the contractions, and especially you're not feeling in that second stage of labor when the baby goes down the vagina, um, there's some evidence that with epidurals, the contractions and pushing are less effective. So you're more likely to have the baby get stuck or have the baby not come out as easily when you have an epidural than if you don't. Not to mention the fact you don't actually feel the baby coming out. Um, uh, yet another, um, yet another uh, kind of medical intervention has to do with these cases where the baby gets stuck in brick, and I'll mention that happened with, uh, with Andres, with Bunny with his big giant head. And the, perhaps the, one of the oldest forms of intervention in childhood is using forceps. And forceps are kind of like salad togs. So they're basically, I mean, in fact, they're exactly like salad tongs, they're tongs that the uh, doctor uses to actually put it around a baby's head and then use that to actually pull the baby down the birth canal. Um, uh, and kind of more, slightly more high-tech version of this, which I actually have with my first baby, it's called a Montus, which is like a little vacuum tube. So it's like a little vacuum cleaner that goes up and swoops onto the baby's head and then you can use that to actually pull the baby uh, down the birth canal. It's a little more gentle than the, uh, the forceps. So my first baby, um, Alexei, has a little bump on his head from where the Montus is swooshed him out. Um, so those are both uh, those are both ways of trying to get the baby out down uh, the birth canal. And again, when they're used by people who are expert, both of those are not uh, very dangerous for the baby. But of course, if the baby's really stuck, then there can be issues about what happens with forceps and monches as well. And one of the things I think is actually a bit unfortunate is that because their sections have become more and more common, uh, one of the things about forceps and monches is you have to be skillful to use them. As you can imagine, it actually takes some it takes some good motor coordination to actually be able to use these tongs to pull the baby out. Um, and fewer and fewer doctors have that skill because more and more what happens is that in situations in which in the past a doctor might have used forceps or monches, they simply do cesarean sections. Um, yet another uh, medical procedure, which I mentioned last time, is uh, using an, uh, doing what's called physiotomy. And physiotomy means, remember the whole the whole problem with birth is you've got this big baby head getting, getting out through this relatively small opening. Uh, one small opening is the cervix, but another small opening is actually the opening, the vaginal opening. And the physiotomy means that they actually snip the edge of the, uh, of the vagina to let the baby uh, get out more easily. So they actually make a little cut to make the vagina uh, expand. Um, and it's not painful because by the time they're doing it, which is when the baby's actually coming out, uh, those muscles are stretched so tight because they're sort of naturally numb anyway. Um, now, as I mentioned last time, one of the things that sometimes happens is that, that, that those tissues naturally tear if they
there's no evidence that actually doing a physiotomy is any better on any ground than the tears that just come natural. And again, well, sorry, let, let me go back on all I'm saying. So, uh, and one of the problems with the physiotomy is that then if you get stitched up again for my first baby, the one who had the tonsils, they did a physiotomy, and then there's stitches, and then you got stitches in a sensitive part of your anatomy for the next, um, for the next several months. So. Uh, uh, perhaps the most drastic but an increasingly common medical intervention in childbirth is a cesarean section. And what happens in a cesarean section is that the entire process gets bypassed, and instead they make an incision in the mom's belly and literally just lift the baby out of the mom's uterus. And part of what's happened, again, it's one of these ironies, is that cesarean sections have become safer and safer and easier and easier to do, so now there's not very much risk to the mother or the baby from doing a cesarean section. And the result is that they become more and more frequent, to the point where 30% of births now in the United States are done by through cesarean sections. Um, and the, I think it's a fair thing to say that nobody thinks that 30% of births should be done by cesarean section, but the trouble is uh, figuring out which ones should be and which ones shouldn't be. And you've got this combination of um, doctors who are very trained to do cesarean sections kind of get told that this is what you should do in any situation where things get to be complex. And of course, we also have a, a legal system that uh, makes it very, very easy and common to sue doctors, especially obstetricians and gynecologists, for malpractice if something goes wrong during the birth. So if a doctor, the problem is the way the incentives go is if the doctor does a cesarean section and everything's okay, then no one will sue him, no one will complain. But of course, if he doesn't do a cesarean section and something goes wrong, then people can come in and, uh, and sue him for not having done a cesarean section. So there are very strong incentives to actually do cesarean sections, even though I think the general consensus is that it's pretty unlikely that 30% of cesarean sections are necessary. And when you do a cesarean section, it's like any other operation, it means that the mom's it's painful and the mom has to have anesthesia and then mom has to be stitched up afterwards. So that first 24 hours with the mother and the baby isn't going to be the same as it is when you have, have the kind of natural childbirth that I described last time. Okay, now the important, yeah? Yeah, exactly. So part of the other reason why there's such a high rate of cesarean sections is that although more people are trying to have not have cesarean sections on, on, on next pregnancies, the chance that you'll have cesarean section afterwards goes up substantially. So, um, so once women are having cesarean sections for the first baby, we, we, again, I mean, it's the irony is the first baby is more likely to be more complicated. Um, so usually second babies and third babies are easier, but once you have the cesarean section, then it becomes more likely to have a cesarean section for the next uh, birth as well, partly because that part of your, of your body is now vulnerable, right? If you've got scar tissue there and so forth. So it, it, it would be very bad if what happened was that some, that portion of your body got stretched out when you were actually trying to give uh, birth naturally. Uh, yeah? Well, let me get to that. Let me get to that at that point in a second, because uh, that's a general. Point. So, um, so what has to be said about all of these, and this is one of the kind of paradoxes, is that for all of these. Um, uh, okay, so let's get to the big question, which is, should we be doing these interventions or not? So for all of these interventions, the problem is that there are medical cases in which all of these interventions are a good idea and are necessary and ought to be done. So there are certain cases in which babies need to be delivered by cesarean section, because otherwise the baby would die. Um, and there are cases where uh, the baby's in distress, for example, and you need to um, you need to induce labor. Um, so the, 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 for each one of these procedures, there's a justification for actually having a procedure. And one would think that if women are in a lot of pain and they want to have an epidural, they ought to be able to have the option of not being in that pain. So in each of these cases, you can think of contexts in which it would be justified to do that kind of intervention. But there are other things that make that story more complicated. One of them is that the interventions tend to interact with one another. And I already described that. So if you induce labor, you're likely to have stronger labor pain, which means that you're more likely to have an epidural, which means that you're less likely to push effectively, which means that you're more likely to uh, end up with a C-section, for example. So there's interactions between the interventions. Another thing is that, as I mentioned last time, uh, there seem to be quite strong effects of social context. So depending on when you look at uh, when you look at different hospitals and different doctors, you see very, very different rates of these kinds of interventions without any clear correlation to how well off the babies or the, or the mothers are. So there's much, much more medical intervention in the United States than there is in any other uh, developed country. And if anything, the infant mortality rates in the United States are worse than they are in other countries. Uh, in Holland, as I mentioned, most babies, most un, um, most uncomplicated deliveries actually take place at home. So there it seems to be so on the one hand, you might say, well, okay, it's simple. Let's just do these things when they're really necessary or when the mother really wants them, and not do them when they're unnecessary and the mother doesn't want them. But whether they're necessary or not seems to be something that's getting judged very differently in different social contexts, in different countries, in different hospitals, by different uh, by different doctors. And that makes it not so straightforward to say that they're simply being done because they're necessary or they're not. And a final thing that I think is extremely <laughs> makes this issue really complicated is about how do you calculate what you think of as being an acceptable risk. Um, and this is something that psychologists have thought about a lot. And we know that people are not very good at figuring out uh, what actually figuring out things like risks or probabilities. And the trouble is that as far as babies are concerned, anything bad happening to the baby is such an overwhelmingly negative outcome that it would completely outweigh anything else. So if someone comes to you in pregnancy and says, well, there's a one with 24 zeros chance that something will go wrong if we don't do a cesarean section, you're not sitting there and working out the 24 zeros. You're just saying, no, no chance at all of anything possibly going wrong for my baby. And again, that's exacerbated by the fact that um, that uh, we have a legal system that turns that calculation of risk into a genuine real risk for doctors of having their practices fold up, fold up because they've been sued for not practice. Um, so what all this means is that the, uh, what all this means is that that experience of uh, the question about, well, let's just do these things if they're necessary and not if they aren't necessary, is actually a, a lot more complicated. So it isn't obvious. I think a general picture that most people would have is, at the moment, there's much more medical intervention that is actually necessary. And the question is, how do you decide in any individual case whether that intervention is really necessary or, or could be avoided? Um, and how you can decide, how you can balance those kinds of probabilities when people are making individual decisions for themselves. Um, okay, so let's take uh, one of our explanation breaks. And uh, it, again, you each, will, I guess we, we'll start with the outside, um, and then talk about why different mothers might, what is there about even mothers or the context that might lead different mothers to have really different uh, experiences of birth. <coughs> And we'll take three minutes.
Uh, I should also mention, uh, I, I was going to mention, how many think there are Downton Abbey addicts? Oh, yeah, I am. Downton Abbey junkies is probably the best way of describing it. Uh, if you watch the last episode of Downton Abbey, exactly this question came up about what the Lady Sybil had had preeclampsia, and the question was whether or not they were going to do uh, a C-section on her, and what the effect of the C-section would have been. And it was the same kind of question, trying to do the counterfactuals about what would happen in one circumstance versus another. Okay. All right, so what's the product of all this? The product of all this is a newborn, beautiful newborn baby, after all that medical service. Um, and here is actually, in response to what someone was asking about, uh, that hideous, exhausted woman is actually me, because this is 2 a.m. on October the 8th, and it's five minutes after Augie, my grandson, was born. So. My first grandson, yeah. My first grandson. I should actually get some pictures of when I was actually in, giving birth the first time, and I was a lot prettier, just as exhausted. Who's that one? Who are you looking at one? Who is it? Oh, good boy. <laughs> there he is. He's too high. Okay. So that's Augie five minutes. That's Augie five minutes after he was born. And his daddy, as you can see, already has me stereotyped as uh, being the reading lady. Um, it's kind of nice because he now Augie is 16 months, and apparently when he gets within about a block of our house when I'm about to babysit for him, he says, "Grandpa, flowers, book, 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 book." No, Alexei's, Alexei's uh, 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 prophecy there. It's your dad's future. Uh, all right, so what do we know about newborn babies? Well, what I'm going to talk about today, we're going to talk later about what newborn babies uh, can see and understand about the world. But what I'm going to do today is talk about some of the basics about what newborn babies are like and how they're experiencing the world. Uh, and one of the most significant, that's all the maybe 10 minutes after that first little video. Um, so one of the most important things about newborn babies, and in fact infants in general, especially in the first few months of life, is this concept of arousal. So arousal means how tuned you in you are to what's going on around you, how excited you are. Um, and arousal turns out to be really important for trying to understand what's happening with babies. So arousal is the difference between, you know, when I wake up the first thing in the morning, I haven't had my tea yet, I haven't had my breakfast yet, I'm completely bleary-eyed, I couldn't talk to you at all, to the time at about... Oh, at about 10 or 11 when I'm at my absolute best and awake and full of vibrancy and energy to the time around 3 o'clock when I'm desperate for my tea again and I'm falling asleep and then I have my good afternoon time when I actually get to do all my writing and then I start to get sleepy again by 9 or 10 o'clock and then hopefully I get up to sleep. So all of us go through those kinds of cycles of arousal during the day. So we go from being asleep to being kind of sleepy and dozy to being awake and alert. And sometimes if we've had a really, so that, that's what that, that schedule I just described is on a good day. But if I've had either a really stressful day or a really exciting day, today is graduate visitors day. So all our potential graduate students are going to be visiting. I'm going to be spending all day talking to them and trying to sell them on what a wonderful place Berkeley is. And that means that there's a good chance that when 10 or 11 o'clock rolls around, instead of just drifting off to sleep, I'll be sitting there with my head spinning and staying awake all the time. So arousal levels have to do with this basic basic phenomenon of how tuned in you are to what's going on around you, how excited you are. And you can see with newborn babies this kind of cycle from the baby being asleep, and that's all again with his daddy, who I can't believe was the one who was actually delivered the um, uh, from actually being asleep to being in a kind of state of peaceful alertness, that's again Augie, okay. just looking calmly around and seeing what's going on, uh, to a state of intense crying. That's not Augie, okay. not unfortunately because Augie has never actually intensely cried because we don't take pictures of him when, he, when he's intensely crying. Um, so babies kind of cycle through this sequence of, babies cycle through this sequence of arousal levels, ranging from being asleep to being sort of calm and awake and tuned in to being uh, uh, over aroused and actually crying and thrashing and so forth. Um, and then sometimes what happens, what you can, what you hope will happen is that the babies can calm down again and then when they calm down and they can sleep and then they wake up again and then they're in a period of calm arousal for a while and then they get into this state of crying and thrashing and, uh, and being over aroused. Uh, so one of the things that we know about arousal levels in babies is that they're much more variable than they are in adults. So there's a joke that uh, Tim Geithner during the, who was the finance secretary during the 2008 crisis, somebody asked him, well, how are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm fine, I'm sleeping like a baby. Every three hours I wake up and cry. Uh, and that's a pretty good description of what sleeping like a baby is actually like. So um, one of the things about these arousal levels is that there's much more variation and difference in the babies than there is in a typical adult. So at least on most days, I don't go within 20 minutes from being fast asleep to being calm and happy, just screaming at the top of my lungs and thrashing and crying. It occasionally happens, but uh, not often within 20 minutes. And it's really unusual for that to happen seven or eight or nine times during the course of the day. But that's typically what happens with newborn babies. So they go through these cycles, the levels of arousal are much more variable than they are for adults who sort of stay at the same place most of the, most of the time. Um, there's also individual differences, which in fact one of the most striking individual differences among babies seems to be what good they are at controlling their arousal, arousal level for another. So some babies are sort of 